section. Good, 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 good. Welcome to the evening service tonight. We're excited that you're here tonight. We've got a good word from the pastor tonight. Um, I'm going to be Jody tonight. Jody is sick. We need to continue to pray for him. Uh, he had flu B or whatever. He's better now. But uh, So I'm going to be Jody tonight. So I'm going to do the, the missionary of the month, which is the McCarver family. And we're supposed to have a PowerPoint that's behind me. So technology is a wonderful thing when it works. So I'm going to go ahead and go through this. We're going to show some pictures of the family and some of the ministry they're doing. So the McCarver family is serving in El Paso and Ciudad Juarez, New Mexico. We affectionately know it as Juarez. Ciudad Juarez means city of Juarez. There you go. Thank you. So it's Glenn and Amy McCarver. Uh, they have three children, Kayla, Ethan, and Seth. They also have um, Glenn's dad there, Bobby, and uh, their granddaughter, Aria. So they're based in El Paso, but they go across the border into Juarez and uh, minister there. Um, El Paso, if you're unfamiliar with, has one of the largest military bases there, so they minister to the military uh, personnel as well. Uh, there's like 150,000 residents there in El Paso. Um, they are sent out by Northside Baptist Church uh, in Snyder, Texas, where we have a connection there because our missionary, Tim, has done some work there in Snyder. So we have a connection there. Um, there is a sign-up sheet in the back, so make sure you sign it. It's not a sign-up sheet. It's a sign saying that you're, sign up that you're going to pray for them. Uh, we'll send that to them at the end of the month. Um, they have a couple of requests. Uh, they need a 12-passenger church van for use on both sides of the border. Uh, they need growth in their services, and they need either property to build or a, an existing building for funds. So we need to be sure we pray for our missionaries. Um, Dar, would you mind wording our prayer for the missionary? So a really cool story about Brother Glenn and Miss Amy, we go back like four decades. They were in our East Central Florida youth uh, rally and local association, and I've known Miss Amy's family, the Barker family, for many, many years, many pastors in that family, Brother Joe, Brother Ted, Ted Sr. was the pastor, Forced Avenue Baptist Church in Apopka, Florida, where I got to meet them, and uh, Glenn has done many uh, mission outreaches, Minnesota and Russia are a couple places he's been, and he's been working hard in um, El Paso now for several years. So you continue to remember them in prayer. I want to invite you to the book of Exodus chapter 18 tonight. Exodus chapter 18, this really speaks to something that's been very dear to me for over a year now, and I've tried to let God speak to it. But I'm going to speak to it a little bit through the word tonight, and I just want you to prayerfully consider what I'm about to share with you. But while you're going there, let me give you a little preface. How many of you remember when Sunday school started, the very first time Sunday school started? Anybody? You probably don't, because believe it or not, Sunday school was actually birthed like in the late 1700s. So you got a good reason why none of y'all raised your hand. If you did, I was going to worry a little bit. Sunday school was actually not started for a lot of the reasons that we do it now. 
One of the reasons why it was started was similarly, and it reminds me of a little bit of the model of what we do with ESL and also what uh, Rusty uh, Tier is doing over across uh, the world over in uh, Thailand. And so when, when I was looking at what this history spoke to, um, children were working six days a week up to 12 hours a day. There were no labor laws, understand, back in the old days. And so there was just work that needed to be done. The industrial age was booming. And so what was happening was these kids were having to work all kinds of hours. Well, if you're working all those hours, guess what? You don't have time for education. So education was being compromised, and these kids were growing up, and they didn't have learning skills, basic learning skills. So somebody got the idea, well, we can kill two birds with one stone. Let's start having this gathering and we can bring all these people, and understand, you can see some of these old pictures of Sunday school, they were not age appropriate. You'd have adults, you'd have kids, you'd have teenagers, and they'd all mingle into this one room, this schoolhouse kind of environment, and there they would open the Bible and they would learn how to read. That's not what we think about when we think of Sunday school now. What's happened is where it started, nothing wrong with, by the way, taking the Bible as an uh, opportunity to help people learn but also to learn more importantly about Jesus. So it became a wonderful, wonderful resource. It eventually became what it is now through definitely many, many uh, years of adapting and, and uh, moving through society and such. But it, that jump came from England and it eventually came over to America. Religious education grew leaps and bounds. And through that, there was a group of people raised up that became leaders and they went back and they helped others. And they, were, they paid it forward, if you will, as they grew and became teenagers. It's rather interesting when you think about that. Um, I wanted you to take that in consideration because this model that we see, and it's really a model that I've needed in my life, uh, and we all probably need in various ways. You don't have to be in pastoral ministry to see what the Lord can do through the beauty of delegation. Um, but in, in Exodus chapter 18, would you stand for the reading of God's word? Exodus chapter 18, I want you to see, beginning in verse 13. So daddy-in-law comes for a visit. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Daddy-in-law shows up. He's going to have, he's coming to check out the family. And Jethro shows up. And so this is the conversation that he and Moses have as he sees Moses' responsibility. Verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow, or tomorrow, that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. They were there all day, line after line, person upon person. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to thy people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? So there's an interesting phrase that he brings in there. And all the people stand by thee from morning until evening. Moses said unto his father-in-law, because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter that they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God, another important uh, phrase there, and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, the thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely weary, wear away. But both thou and this people that is with thee for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Don't worry about the word rulers. It has the idea of leaders, okay? Verse 22, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee but every small matter they shall judge, so it shall be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure. 
And all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Father, your word is your word. May it be what it says. May it move our hearts. May we see things that you reveal, even from a many, many time ago, uh, hundreds and hundreds, thousands and years ago. But Father, biblical truth is biblical truth. It doesn't change, for you never change. And so, Father, thank you for what you've revealed to us. Father, I pray that it would stir within us, it would burden us, and that, Father, your will will be greatly accomplished as we continue to do those things that are pleasing to you as you have commanded us. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So I see some things in this that I think really speak to some things about where we are in landmark culture right now. I want to ask a question real quick. Are we on right now? We are on Facebook Live. Okay, good. That's what I was kind of hoping so, actually. So that's good. All right. So I want anybody that's listening can listen to this as well. Because in studying what is working in churches and studying what are working with us and studying how we're doing and where we're growing, there are things that I see here in this scripture that can really help us, I believe, take that next step forward in a lot of ways. So I gave you an illustration of Sunday school. We didn't always have Sunday school. The Bible doesn't use the word Sunday school, but it was a good model to take into consideration. And hundreds of years later, how be it changed a little bit in the formatting and the way they've gone about it, still incredibly effective. We had 170 plus people this morning in our congregation that sat under the word of God, the counsel of God, the teaching of God, and I'm so thankful for that. There's a lot of blessings that come with a model like Sunday school, not only do we get to learn, but you that are leading out in whatever time period we have in there, whether you're working with the little, little ones, and somebody I'll even write in here in the morning, sing with them, and they learn the music. We are developing and cultivating leaders in this environment. So we have people, some of you have been teaching many years, some of you have started recently in teaching, but we have developed a team of leaders through Sunday school. And I, and I love that because that's critical. We need to have people who are not just Sitting and absorbing, and that's a critical, but we need teachers as well, and so that's important. I got thinking about, well, we do this. Where did this Wednesday night thing come from? I'm just curious. I want, I want especially our students that are here tonight to see this. How many of you adults, when you were growing up, if you went to church when you were growing up, got to do student ministry on Wednesday nights the way we do it now? How many of you adults did that? How many of you adults did not get to meet in the middle of the week on Wednesday night, but you sat in a congregation like we're doing tonight? Raise your hands. See, you students don't see that, but that's why I'm sure. The majority of people here, we didn't always do it the way we're doing it now. Is it the way we're doing it now necessarily wrong? No. I think it's tremendously effective, quite honestly, because instead of having one large group, we divide off into various sectors of the church. Do you know that movement actually started with a totally different emphasis so I've mentioned, and I got the privilege of seeing his property uh, last year, D.L. Moody, the evangelist, and, and he had a place in the Massachusetts area that they did schooling and did his uh, gospel uh, uh, base, if you will, but they developed schooling there as well. I said, I would say this, where we get what we do on Wednesday nights, we used to call Wednesday nights, anybody know? Midweek prayer service, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. We don't do that anymore. Are we wrong? I don't think so necessarily, but what was started then is an emphasis of we need to meet and we need to pray came from the likes of D.L. Moody with these evangelistic outreaches and a burden for revival. And so churches would come together and pray for such things. A lot of their prayer emphasis was not on the things that we focus on. And we don't want to make it sound like that these prayer requests that we have a lot of times physical are not important. I mean, myself included, we all appreciate that, but they were focused on revival. And they were focused on evangelism and things like this. And so they would meet and they would do these things. And so when that time started to change, they didn't want to quit meeting. So they used that purpose differently. And eventually, it, through time, it morphed into what we kind of know today. But my church, when I was a teenager, didn't have that. I probably would have gotten in a little bit less trouble. And I might have been a little bit further along if I'd had it, just being honest. But we did what we always did. We had church on the morning, we had church in the evening, we had church on Wednesday night. And that's what we did. Nothing wrong with that. But churches started figuring out. And at some point in the history of Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, this church decided 
we need to do something differently on Wednesday night. Some of you may have been here when that time came. But we have reaped the harvest. Again, going back to what I said about Sunday school, more people in leadership, more people in, a, in an environment where you can ask questions and discuss conversation and open the Bible in such a way. And so you can do those things. And, and I love Wednesday nights in here, by the way. It's one of my favorite times. It's been that way for years in churches where we have student ministry on Wednesday night um, because it's such a blessing to be able to be closer, interactive and such. Now, what does that have to do with Exodus 18? Everything. Because what you see happening in the life of Israel and the life of the leader in Moses, Jethro caught on. Sometimes you need another set of eyes. And I'm thankful for the Jethros in, in culture that have called me off to the side at times and said, Pete, I know what you're doing and you're not doing something wrong, but I think you need to look at it from a different set of eyes. You're going to hurt yourself. You're gonna, and what Jethro was doing as a concerned father-in-law was like, you're doing something that's not best operational-wise. You got a lot of people standing around. You got yourself and you got this long line. You're wore out. They're wore out. And it's becoming tedious. Maybe you need to tweak the system. And so we see the problem, one large group with one worn out man. That's not healthy. So they said, let's figure out a solution to this. Their solution was to divide the groups and develop multiple leaders. And with that, you see structure. And I've learned to say this a lot when it comes to ministry over the last decade or so. Oftentimes we would just say, you know, Lord, lead us in this. And we're like, okay. And then we do things for a while. And then we say, no, your church, I say your church, that's the wrong words. Before I got here, Landmark, before I got here, made a decision, whether you liked it or not, about BTC, I learned. Now, we made a similar decision at the previous church that I was at. And mind you, the attendance was good. But I saw what it was doing to the people. I saw how it would become more of an obligation. And so we recognized what was happening and the burdens and the stretch on all of our people. And so we, we said enough's enough. And we voted to not, not have it anymore. That was a very hard decision. I've never changed a model as a pastor in any church I've been in up until that point in leadership. And I wasn't excited about it, but I knew what this passage was saying then, and I know what it says today. If we are exhausted, if we're wore out, if we're hurting ourselves more than helping ourselves, then maybe we need to reconsider it. That was in that situation. Now, what we did here at that time and the life before I got here was between you and the Lord, and I'm not against whatever because I believe there's healthy decisions that we have to make from time to time. But there was a strategy that Jethro, ministering to people on their level. Did you notice the people groups? The Bible mentions thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and that sounds really confusing. But you understand the nature of why they were meeting would dictate the large populations or the small populations. We're surely meeting in a class environment of a 1,000 people. Most teachers, and we have several in here that understand the school system, know the benefit of having a class that's limited in size as opposed to it just brimming over with 100 people or more, especially when you're trying to teach a skill or something very critical. The Word of God is very critical, by the way, and we want to make sure we reach people where they're at. Likely the thousands was more of a military model where you would have troops, and we can understand that as opposed to the 50s and 10s might be, or hundreds might be more from an administrative perspective, where the 50s and 10s might be more of what we're talking about along the lines of biblical education. So I just think God's showing us here Jethro's wisdom, the spirit of God moving, and this, this model being implemented, that there was some efficiency that needed to be tweaked. They were spending their energy, and it wasn't sustainable on the long haul. Moses was going to wear himself out. Jethro's been there a day, and he can already pick up on it. He sees what's going on. So we got a problem. What's the result? What's the benefit in all this? Why, why even uh, bring this up? And why is it even in the Bible, right? Because that's the first question when I ask, why do, we, why do we have this matter in the Bible? Is it really that important? I mean, there's a lot more things that got to be said. But, you know, the Bible is not only biblically spiritual for us, but it's also very practical, so that we can go for the long haul. It mentions here a couple times alone. We don't want to have to shoulder the load alone. And that's part of the life we do. Uh, Brother Doug mentioned it 
uh, today in our brotherhood about having substitute teachers. It, it's always good. Jesus sent them out in pairs. The tandem effect is good. When Paul went out on missionary journeys, you see how the people went out. Paul, Silas, Paul, Barnabas. So we know there was others like Timothy that would come along too. There's encouragement factor that comes with that. So what's the result? What's the end result? What comes from all this that they endure? He says there, if you do these things, you shall be able to endure. We want the long haul effect. We don't want to burn people out. We don't want to wear people out. We want to make sure we're in this for the long haul, that we're doing it to the best of our ability. And that's what I was talking about earlier, this model. Is, do we just want to do what's good? Do we want to do what's better? Or do we want to do what's absolutely the best for the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the things I've started asking myself more and more. Oh, we can do anything. You know, we can, we, this past week or two weeks ago, we did something right on this stage that in 20 plus years of trunk and treat, Lisa and I have never done, never seen. And we came inside in part because of the weather. Now, there was a lot of tweaking that went on to make that happen. And there was even this, the thought process of maybe adjusting it at the very end, but now we stuck with it. And there were great things and there were some challenges that came with it. So we understand that going into next year. But that's the things that you have to do sometimes. No, 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 Pastor, you've, you've always done it outdoors. You've always done it. Yeah, and that works to a degree, but then there's a lot of distraction too. So maybe that was a good thing while we came inside. These are things we're asking ourselves. So sometimes you have to look a little bit and think outside the box when it comes to practical matters, nothing doctrinal, nothing that we're going to be kicked out of the church for, just, you know, questions you ask out loud. So when we examine the models at Landmark, what's best in the work of the Lord? Have you thought for a while why we do what we do on Sunday mornings? Why we sing? You understand that the model that we have for worship, I, I'm scaring you and you don't need to be scared. I'm not interested in doing anything different with anything we're doing on Sunday morning. Really, I'm not interested in doing anything different, period. Just doing what's best. And so there's a lot of times we do an analysis check. Talk to Austin about how's music going, what's going on. Talk to Brother Doug about how Sunday school's running. And we want to make sure everything's running at its best. Is there anything we need to do? Is there anything we need to make adjustments on? Anything we need to reconsider so that we can make it its very best? That's what we're trying to do. But have you thought about why we do this? I've never read in the Bible, by the way, where they had three or four songs, an offering, then the preaching, you know, had a special maybe or a choir special. Is what we're doing wrong? No, I love it. Let me get that out of the way before you all start worrying. But I want to make sure you understand Sometimes we don't realize that we've been doing things and we have to go, wait a minute. So we do something different like tonight. Do you, by the way, let me just get this out. Do you realize why? And you can talk to Austin about this. This is a conversation he and I had. I'm Austin, I'm going to throw you under the bus with me, okay? Might as well just do this together. Do you know why we're not singing on Sunday night? Most of you are not singing on Sunday night. And it's very miserable to try to lead a worship group. And that's no offense. You're just saying by your voices that you're not really probably going to sing. And that's not, that's not bad. You're not horrible, but there's no point in doing something if no, no the group's not participating in it. So this is why. And so we just said instead of, and some of you are going, well, we should sing. Yeah, we should be in church a lot more too, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's things that we have to consider about the way we do. And so we try to do the best with what we can. And that's what we're looking at. The result, less and more. I like the way this scripture in verse 23 reads um, in the CEV. It says, this is the way God wants it done. I like that. No nonsense. You won't be under nearly as much stress, and everyone else will return home feeling satisfied. That sounds like a great day. That sounds like a great, that sounds like a best model. Not an okay model, but a best model. So this is the concern. In looking at what we do on Sunday mornings, I see a lot of success. I see the fact that there's a workforce that can't always be here, and we have people that get sick, and so our numbers tend to fluctuate a little bit on Sunday morning, but on the whole, and this morning we had a wonderful attendance, but more importantly, the attendance of spirit was powerful, and I appreciate you lending your voices, lending your participation, lending your time in Bible study, all these things. Sunday's, Sunday mornings always it seems to be a very strong point in a lot of our churches, including ours. Wednesday nights have, have improved a lot over the last two years. I think we were good, and I think we were healthy, but, you know, we, we worked on a couple things, and really not so much anything hard, just reorganization of some things. Maddie's made some adjustments in curriculum, a little bit with the schedule. Brother David's tweaked some things a little bit, and, and it's very successful right now on Wednesday nights. There's things that can be improved, like anything. 
And it's not that it's bad. But we come to Sunday night. And you look around here, and it looks a lot better when we're in two middle columns, aren't we? Two middle rows. That's why I like this, because personally, it's encouraging. When we sit where we normally sit on Sunday nights, it's hard. Because things are different on Sunday night than what we're used to in this setting on Sunday morning. And it can be challenging, even discouraging if we're not careful. Um, and so I have concerns about where we are on Sunday night, just being brutally honest with you. I look around, and I want you to look around, and I'm thankful for the segment of teenagers we have here. The average age of our adults in here is a much higher on the spectrum, and I wish it was lower, but there's an age demographic in our church that's not as invested on Sunday night. And I know there's stipulations and reasons, but I want what we do to be best. And so I don't know if that means we need to consider how we do Sunday night. I do know this, it's not in my vocabulary to yield. I'm not interested in saying, let's just not do anything. That's a bad answer. I mean, if you haven't looked around, we're in trouble in this world. We need all the Lord Jesus we can get. So maybe we need to look at what we're doing and assess how we're doing. Maybe there's a better way of doing it. Well, one of the tweaks that has been made recently in church life is the two examples I gave you, going from a large group model into a small group model. And so maybe that's something we need to pray about and consider, is on Sunday nights considering that. Whether you do it off campus or on campus makes no difference to me. What is your goal, pastor? Why bring all this up? There's one thing that I have to do when I stand before Jesus Christ. I believe every pastor ought to have this burden. I believe every Christian ought to have this burden. Every Christian leader should. And we are here to produce disciples. Now, that means seeing people raised up in Christ, growing in the scriptures, growing in Christian life, and then as a result of that, producing other Christians. That's how you do this. And I'm not sure that Sunday night is effectively reaching this. We don't have visitors on Sunday night like we do traditionally on Sunday morning or even Wednesday night in comparison. You say, Pastor, it's the culture. Everybody, I, that's not a good answer, y'all. That, that's, that's, that's not a wrong answer, but I don't think that's gonna work when I stand before Jesus and I don't think that's the answer we should come with. What I think we should do is win the loss at any cost as we sing. I think we should do everything we possibly can. Paul spoke to that in becoming all things to all people. And so we talked about that a few weeks ago on Wednesday night. Are we doing that? Are we burdened about that? Well, when I look at what Jethro spoke about here, I'm sure Moses was a little reluctant. No, 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 I've been doing it this way a long time and this is what works. He said, yeah, but it's not sustainable. That's why I worry about the age gap. What's gonna happen eventually? Are we gonna sustain this or is this gonna gradually just eventually fade off? Most of us that are here tonight are here because we've never done anything different on a Sunday night, but this is what we were raised to do. We go to church on Sunday night. I know, I know that's the way I feel a lot of times, but I'm glad I'm here. I'm not upset about it. I don't want to sit at home on a Sunday night. Uh, quite honestly, I'm not used to the fifth Sunday model here. I'm not against it, but it's different for me. I like being in church. I like being with God's people on Sunday night. It's just what I know. That's comfortable. But maybe that's the problem too. Like Moses, maybe we've got a little comfortable with a system that maybe is not what we need to be considering. I said all that to say this. We want ministerial growth. We want vitality and health in our church. We want people to grow up. We want to raise more leaders. Are we doing that to a degree? Are we doing it to the best of our ability? I hope so. So that's what makes me think, what would it look like? What would be different? Well, you can meet in different classrooms like we do on Sunday morning. You can go to somebody's home and you can open up a Bible study and you could talk about what we talked about like on Sunday morning. You could do a deep dive and you could take that apart and say, you know, Pete was talking about overflow. He was talking about what this looks like. He said, well, pastor, we've never done that. I know, I've never done it either. <laughs> You're not hearing my intrepidation. I don't like doing things because when you're 54, almost 55, you get comfortable because I'm in that crowd. But that's not the answer I need to stand before Christ with. The answer is, Lord, I want to do what's best and I want him to stay back. Well, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the answer we're looking for, whether it comes as a pastor or whether it comes as a Christian in a church. This is why I want us to consider whatever. 
And what I mean by whatever is just that. Are we doing everything we can? Not to change to change. Don't like that answer. Rather, we look at what God says is most effective. And I want us to pray about these things. Because this is something that's daunting to me. And matter of fact, I've kind of tried to keep it quiet. But the thing is, is about once a month, one of you will come to me without a conversation, and you'll say, Pastor, have you ever thought about small groups? And I'm like, absolutely not. And I told the Brotherhood this morning about that, and I said, five years ago, I, I shot it down. Some of you know Larry Fincher. I know Justin and Sam, you guys do, and some of y'all met him last year, if you didn't know him already. Larry's a dear friend of mine. They, he's done this model for years. And he came to me at a time when we were riding high in a previous church. I mean, we were busting 100 and 30 or so, like in BTC, and that was crazy for a church that was only running about 150 in Sunday school. So it was like, whoa. And he says, hey, I want you to, I think you ought to consider small groups. I said, you're insane. <laughs> I want to meet at church. And that was my answer straight up to him. If you called him right now, he'd tell you, yeah, Pete shot me down. I don't know what the answer is now, y'all. You've asked me to be a spiritual leader for you, and all I know is I'm burdened about what we're doing on Sunday night. I'm concerned about it. I want us to grow in Christ. I ask you to come back for an hour or more, and, and I want you to receive something. I want you to go away charged, and I want you to be at your best. And I, and I want it to be in an environment that is at its best. I want people to want to come back to church on Sunday night. Not because they have to or not because we're used to it or we're comfortable with it, but because we want it. The way we do on Sunday mornings, the way we do on Wednesday nights, and maybe I'm misreading, but in conversations, that's kind of what I've heard a lot of lately. We just come back. That's what we do. Everybody's different, y'all. But the Word of God needs to be proclaimed no matter what we do and how we do it. There's groups across the world that meet in different settings, different environments. We see in the Bible they did the same things. Matter of fact, in the book of Acts, they had house groups. I mean, that's how they started church. Granted, it was a government problem called Rome, so they didn't have a choice. I'm trying to get to an end point in this, and I don't really know where to end except for to ask y'all to pray. Because I'm burdened about everything we do in the Lord, and that includes what we do with the time we spend together on Sunday nights. I think it's something we need to do. And I mean, I mean, pray about it. I mean, really strongly consider how can we be at our best? We have children. It's so awesome when we come to church and there's kids everywhere, and I keep hearing all you parents, stop running, slow down. That's a great blessing. Not for maybe y'all, but it is for me. I want these guys to grow up in a church where they get it and they grow. And it's not just because they come on Wednesday night or they come to Sunday school. Wouldn't it be great if the greatest experience in our church culture was radically different, and it wasn't because of Sunday morning or Wednesday night, but it was actually because of Sunday night? Most people don't say that anymore. But why don't they? And why shouldn't we? It's the Word of God. It matters. So it breaks my heart when I think about these things. I want to just lead you in a time of prayer at this time. And I don't, I'm not asking you to form any decision. I just rocked your world, and I know that. I asked you to color outside the lines because we were always told to color inside the lines. And you know what? I'm just going to be honest with y'all. If we decide to do anything about this, that's fine. And if we don't, that's fine. I'm perfectly at peace with doing whatever God wants us to do. There's no agenda. There's material. There's a thought process. But as long as we get to open the Word of God, that's good. But is that all it should be? That's the point of struggle that I have. Should it be better? Or dare we say, should it be best? Let me pray with you. Father God, I know tonight was way out of the box, way unconventional. Father, we didn't specifically talk about the cross, but I know the cross will be a point of reference no matter what we do on a given Sunday, no matter what it looks like. Father, I also understand that we live in changing times, but that's not the reason we do these things. Father, we know church has changed through time. Sunday school has changed through time. 
Wednesday night midweek prayer services change through time. And so, Father, I just come to a point being honest and transparent with the people I love dearly that I want to dearly see us all grow, become stronger, spiritually healthier. Father, see your beauty be revealed in such a powerful way. So, Father, I'm just praying your leadership and whatever. And, Father, however we need to come to some kind of understanding of this, may we do that. But may we not just meet to meet. You deserve so much better than that. Father, may it not feel forced. That's business meeting. I guess I'm supposed to be there. God forbid. But Father, may it be because of Christ. May it be because of the word. May it be because of the power that we know the word of God brings and the spirit of uh, people coming together and doing life together, Father, what it can become. And Father, may... May we just do something so crazy that people go, I don't know about Sunday morning or Wednesday night, but Sunday night at Landmark is amazing. And I dare say that most churches don't get to say that because of the culture we live in today. And Father, the bigger question is why? May we not be lukewarm. May we be burdened about the things of God that matter, whether it's on a Sunday morning a Sunday night, or even a Wednesday night. Because truly, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. Your will be done in our lives, Father. Thank you for what you're doing and what you're still yet to do. Give us wisdom, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, we're going to take a moment, and then we'll have a, just a brief interlude. And then um, I'm going to be at the back door. You can stand, and if you'd like to leave, you're welcome to. But we do have a lot of important matters in our business tonight that we need to talk about. And so we invite you to stay, some of which will be a carryover. I want to talk to you a little bit about what Sunday night can possibly look like. But I needed to speak to you a little bit from the Word of God about some of the reasons why. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about some options. But I also want to talk to you about other things. Tonight we have the Office of Deacon to consider Tonight, we have important matters when it comes to our finances to consider. So I encourage you to stay. There's a lot of important matters that we'll be discussing. So we invite you to be a part of that. Would you stand with me, please? We've already had our dismissal prayer. So you're welcome to adjourn yourself or just fellowship for a moment. There's paperwork back here.